Here we go. I gotta see my face, right? We're started. We're started? Yep. All right. I thought I'd see my face. Anyway, uh, this is uh, uh, Progress, part two, at the time of the French Revolution and the American Revolution, 1789. This is Athens Speak Out, 418. What's the day? 8th? 7th? We're recording Seventh. on November 7th, and this will air on November 8th, 2017. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, this has been part of a, a long series, and I can start right away because we're really talking about the Trump campaign, and we're both critics of, of Trump, and I'm going to be using this slogan as an introduction for all of my Athens Speak Out from now on. Teddy Roosevelt talked about the Square Deal. Franklin Roosevelt talked about the New Deal. And Truman talked about the Fair Deal. And Donald Trump is giving us a bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, we're going to be talking about progress, and uh, it's my understanding that we had a long discussion of progress during the progressive era of um, uh, uh, um, Robert La Follette. Robert La Follette. I can't yeah. think of the names. Yeah. I'm getting Lafollette. slow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Robert La Follette. Robert Follette. And, and we talked about progress in, in the, in the, from, from, La, from progress, from La Follette up through the uh, uh, progress of, of uh, our educator, uh, Progress in Education, Progressive Education, John Dewey. John Dewey, and then I said, well, we should be talking about how progress began at the time of the American Revolution. Right. And we had uh, Condorcet, a French philosopher who believed that because of the Enlightenment and the law of gravity and the French Revolution, that they all became either deists or Unitarians and that progress was inevitable. And all of our presidents, from uh, George Washington's day to the present, have been talking about progress, or liberalism, or conservatism, and these are the two-party system that we now have. And then we have third parties, like the Bull Moose Party, and uh, uh, La Follette's party, who started to talk Progressive about party. independent party, mm -hmm. but they eventually failed in the long run. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Most third parties through American history have right. not fared right. too well. The Bull Moose did okay. Um, Ross Perot did okay in 1992. Right. right. Um, but it, in general, I think the nature of the, the American system tends toward a two-party system. That's right. And not, just, and not just because there are two dominant parties. I think, take the British parliamentary system, for instance. It, it has room for a three-party system that I'm not sure. Too, but it, they don't last long. They don't last long in America. And I think that is a systemic issue. I don't think that that's... I don't, well, no, it's a constitutional issue. The British Constitution basically is a two-party system. The American Constitution is basically a two-party system. Now, the French have always had a five-party system. That's the way the French Constitution was designed. Mm -hmm. They had a f weak president, and the prime minister right. was either a socialist or a liberal or a Catholic or a conservative, and they had parties based on religious ideologies. Mm -hmm. But eventually, in the French Revolution, 
France became a secular republic and they disestablished the Roman Catholic Church, but there is still a Catholic party that runs in France. The Christian Democrats, there are Christian Democrats in, 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 in Europe and in, in, in Germany. So Germany had a three-party system when it was set up by the winners of the World War II and they had it, they divided it into two zones, the French zone, the, no, it was originally the British zone and the American zone and the Soviet zone. And then the French said, well, we want to get in there. So then they redesigned it and said, well, we're going to have five zones. And de Gaulle got in there. And de Gaulle then started the uh, uh, Fifth Republic. The Fourth Republic was demolished in, in well, it, was, it failed in Algeria. Mm -hmm. But the Third Republic was destroyed by the, uh, when, when Hitler invaded. Mm -hmm. Third Republic was, and they set up a satellite regime called the Vichy regime. Right. And Vichy was a satellite government of the French. Well, then Charles de Gaulle, who was a colonel in the British army, fled to Britain and set up his own free French movement. And then when they invaded D-Day, de Gaulle was on the tanks and ended Paris. Mm -hmm. And they had a provisional government called the Fourth Republic. Well, then the Fourth Republic kind of failed. The cabinets lasted for six months and they collapsed. So in 19, uh, uh, de Gaulle, de Gaulle said, I'm going to start the Fifth Republic. And then he introduced the Fourth, which made a big chief executive, and President de Gaulle then made the, uh, the uh, parties, the smaller, they had seven parties, but he eliminated the communists as a factor. He eventually gerrymandered the communists out. So the communists are still viable in France, but as a minor party of insignificance. Mm -hmm. That's the way that the French Constitution designed itself. Well, and the American Constitution okay. um, has seemed to, over history, only really allowed for two significantly powerful Except political parties at any time one of time. Crisis. Um, so the we Republic started with the the Democratic Republican Party of Thomas Jefferson right. and James Madison versus the Federalist Party That's of right. Alexander Hamilton and John Adams and George Washington, at least nominally. Although Washington famously warned in his uh, farewell address against the spirit of faction and against ba essentially what became party politics that were to dominate um, okay. American history from henceforth. But and then we went through several other eras before we got to what we have now. So we had the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. We had the uh, Democratic Republican Party who called right. themselves Republicans, and but this is the, the forebears of the Democratic, Democratic Party. Jackson came along with his version of it. We had the first. We had the era of good feelings. Right. Then we had Jacksonian democracies, uh, capital D. And, the and we had the Whigs. Um, the Whigs became a popular party. And then the Whigs split in the 1850s, and that became eventually the Republican Party, a faction of the rig part Whigs. Of it, part, with, of, part of the Whigs. With the Free Soilers became yeah, yeah, they were fourth party. the Republican. And Lincoln was elected as a Republican, as a Republican because the other parties had split. Right. But that was a temporary. And, and that was a four-person race in 1860. That, that's correct. Um, where, where Lincoln was able to take the majority of the northern state votes right. and therefore win the election. Election, whereas uh, Stephen Douglas only took one state. That's right. Um, John Bigham, is that right? Or I Bigham was, from? No, I thought it was the Liberty Party. Well, it might have been the party. I'm trying to think of the name of the other candidate. I don't remember the candidate. Yeah, but the, the um, party who was, took Kentucky and yeah, that was the yeah. Liberty Party, and then they had the Constitutional Party, I think. Right, which took the Southern states. Yeah, some of which them. is actually uh, Mary Todd Lincoln's cousin. Yeah, was the they eventually disappeared. Right, because he became part of the the Confederacy, right. and then through the rest of American history, you since then, since the 1860s, you basically had the Republican and the Democratic Party, but right. with 
various factions and alliances within both of those parties, both conservative and progressive, all the way until the mid 20th century. Correct. Um, a lot of the party politics were based around uh, ethnicity, geography, right. Right. religion. That's right. Um, That's right. Rural versus ur like city That's right. voters. That's right. all, all those factors played right. into right. it. So um, then, then we get to the problem of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. The difference of uh, Condorcet's belief in inevitable progress and uh, how progress was defined differently in America and in Britain and in, in France and, and in the democracies over time. And uh, Condorcet's idea of the inevitable progress has been downgraded. So most people now talk about the possibility of progress and progress and liberalism and socialism compete on an ideological level today. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is the idea of progress was on the table when the French Revolution and the American Revolution began. No, oh, absolutely. I think and, that there and were... The, the Democrats celebrate the Jackson Jefferson Day dinner. The the Republicans right. only have one hero, the Republican. The Lincoln Day the Lincoln dinner. Republican. Yeah. But the Lincoln Republicans are practically dead in our present Republicans. Well the Republican <laughs> Party is no doubt going through an enormous transition. American right transition. Now. That's right. Uh, you see it with people like Senators uh, Ben Sasse and yeah. Jeff Flake uh, repudiating the That's Trump right. administration right. and the Trump administration's or Trump's political takeover of the Republican Party. That's right. I, I don't think that the current Republican Party in the Trump era would be anything that traditional uh, None. Republicans like None. William F. Buckley might recognize or even care for at this point. And personally, I was thinking the other day about this. Um, I I don't I don't see a way for them. I, I think that the, it might be a split that they're not going to be able to come back from. I think I, that I there think are people I like it could be a Susan Collins and it John McCain and Ben Sasse and, and Jeff Flake who are That's obviously what, not in the Trump wing of this party anymore. That's what the Trump uh, that's what the Democrats hope. Yeah, that's what I hope. <laughs> yeah. Because if if the Republican Party splits in half, then they can't win elections yeah. anymore. Um, but, but it's tough to tell because you're seeing you're actually what I see is um, these people like uh, Flake who are retiring now, and, yeah, I, and they're not putting up a stand. They're leaving. That's right. And they're they're going, and that will open the door for the Trump faction to take over. Right. It won't create a split where there will actually be uh, uh, loggerheads at any point. Right. It will be the Trump faction taking over the Republican Party. I don't know what happens to um, the Republicans who are not in the Trump I faction. I have no prediction for the future. You know, my th theory of history is. Well, yeah, historians look at the past. A historian of politics and religion uses the rule, I use the rule, of Otto von Bismarck, who said that nobody politically can predict the future more than few, a few years. And he had as his example the Crimean War. The Crimean War opened up in 1854 and lasted until 1856. And Bismarck said, there wasn't anybody in Europe who after the revolution of 1848 predicted that war would break out in Crimea. And that was the Bismarck rule, three years, impossible mm -hmm. to predict. And then that came to pass when I was a, a, a young historian mm -hmm. because Roosevelt won the American World War II with the help of Churchill from England 
and communist Russia. They petitioned Germany into three zones. But then the Korean War opened up in 1950, and I had no prediction what, how that would end, because Stalin had intervened, the United States under Truman had intervened through Dean Acheson, and the Soviet Union, no, the Soviet Union, and then China, the People's Republic of China intervened. So nobody knew how it would end, but it ended in a stalemate. Mao did not win, Stalin did not win, and Dean Acheson did not win. They split Korea approximately at the DMZ, which is approximately the 38th parallel, and it's been conditioned ever since. Mm -hmm. Now Trump, an idiotic president, wants to open up a new Korean War. And he tells, he tells the Japanese, why don't you shoot the missiles down? The Japanese said, we haven't shot them down yet. <laughs> we can't hit them. <laughs> Trump doesn't want to shoot the missiles down. He wants the Japanese to shoot them down. Right. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's overreach. Beyond the, 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 the uh, ability to predict. Okay, so that's, that's the end of my predictions. I have no predictions mm -hmm. beyond three years. Now, do we want to get back now to the understanding of progress and liberalism and democracy back during the period from, uh, we'll say, George Washington to, uh, uh, to Thomas, uh, to uh, Andrew Jackson, and why we have basically a two-party system? Now, some of them argue we're progressives, and others are saying, no, we're liberals. There's a lot of debate now. In currently. A, yeah, currently. Yeah. Some people want to call themselves prog progressives and others want to call themselves liberals. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that debate what is... What do you a, call yourself? I call myself... I call myself... I call myself a religious free thinker. I believe that I am 25% Christian, 25% liberal, and 25%, no, no, 12% uh, 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 conservative, and 3% for future growth. So there's where the future growth comes in. Will we end up with more progressives or more liberals at the end of the Trump administration? And will he be impeached? We don't know. Or will Trump end up as a dictator and not step down? And that's the end of democracy forever. We still have hope in democracy, you and I. Right. But I don't think I don't think Donald Trump gives two hoots about democracy. <laughs> oh, I do, yeah, I don't think that he, well, he's displayed over and over again that he doesn't understand the Constitution, he doesn't right. understand the foundational principles of our republic. He probably doesn't even understand the concept of um, a representative constitutional republic. Um, he doesn't seem to have a grasp on basic civics or history, so I wouldn't expect him to care about that. The real question to me is, when it comes time for him to relinquish power, will he do so peacefully as we've had in America since the Civil War? We've had, this is one of the great hallmarks of our nation, is that we've had tra peaceful transitions of power between regimes, between presidencies, um, ever since the Civil War. Right. Now, will Donald Trump attempt Nobody knows. to bring that to an end? I, we don't know for sure. I wouldn't put it past him, but I also, I don't believe that he has, I don't believe, in order to do that successfully, in order to st what, uh, stage what would amount to a coup on the American coup. government, he Who would has need, got the fingers on the button? He That's would the need question. extraordinary <laughs> military backing that I don't think he would have in that That's situation. Right. 
that, that's right. The, the uh, Defense Department, the CIA, have all put out signals. Trump doesn't have his finger on the button. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't, yeah. I, I think that I still believe, despite our, the troubles and the, the ailments of our democracy right now, I still think that we're strong enough and, and healthy enough. Okay. Now, where we're going to be in three years, I don't know. And but do as I. you said, who can predict? Well, but democracy has failed in Weimar, Germany. Democracy failed in, in liberal oh, yeah. Spain. Nobody should take anything for granted. Right. Absolutely right. Okay. So there have been democratic states that... The Constitution is only worth as much as we believe in it. That's right. As a people. The Americans believe in the Constitution. Its power and that's, that's comes from us. That's the importance of the United States. They've had the longest living Constitution. Right. And it evolves. Right. The, the French Constitution... I believe it's a living document, yes. The French Constitution have... They've had seven regimes and 13 constitutions. Right. They kept changing them during the French Revolution and the Counter-Revolution. Now, the Soviets, the new, not the new Soviet, uh, Don, uh, Vladimir Putin says that he has a constitution, but it's run by the FSB, <clears throat> the Federal Police. Right. And the Communist Party was always centralized although they gave theoretical constitutional rights to the various nationalities. Yeah, mostly in name only. Uh, right. Uh, a lot of these are paper democracies. They're not, That's they're right. not real right. democracies right. on the ground. Okay. Well, okay, let's get back now to 1789, France and the United States. Do you want to say any... Well, I will, I will read the question. Do you believe in the possibility of progress. Oh, as in context of the 1780s? From, from now to today. Well, do you believe that... Yeah, I actually do call myself a progressive. You call yourself a progressive. Yeah. But you don't call yourself a liberal. Um, I, I am fairly liberal, but if I'm going to choose between a label, liberal or progressive, I will, I will usually say progressive Good. over liberal. Right. Um, Especially because of uh, the confusion of l the current idea of an American liberal and then classic liberalism, and then you have neoliberalism. Right. I think it's just easier and more, uh, okay, um, a better definition to call well, myself progressive. You can call yourself anything you want. I could. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, so, as f insofar as it relates to the American Revolution, though, I think that a lot of people, well, first of all, let's make note of what an extraordinary thing the American Revolution and the American Constitutional Republic was at the time of its founding. Right. We were in an <coughs> era of human history where every government and most governments throughout history were monarchical in nature. That's right. Um, the only other republics to have existed before the American Republic came along were uh, the Greeks and the Roman, the Greek city-states, not even whole countries, but city-states, and the Roman Republic. And um, it was also a Dutch Republic. And the, and the Dutch, and the first stadtholderless <laughs> state, which was brought on actually by uh, ancestors of mine, Johan and Cornelius de Witt. Right. Um, that was in the 1600s. Right. The 1650s to the 1670s right. is when the Dutch stadtholderless state first right. came about. Um, so this was a really extraordinary moment in the history of human civilization when the American Republic was able to first gain independence and then establish itself as a, as a republic. Um, this right. was an extraordinary thing, and it gave, it gave great confidence and right. in many ways inspired the French Revolution. And you had American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson, for instance, right. who were um, very energized and excited about the idea of uh, a republic sweeping away these old monarchical systems. Right. And, and maybe this will happen in France. And I think he was caught off guard a little bit by how violent things got in right. France. Now, the Bill of Rights gives the American people the right of free speech, free press, 
free, uh, free, uh, freedom of assembly, and the right of freedom of religion, which means that the government cannot establish to set up a tax-based religious republic. Now, they right. were still religious. Establishment and free exercise. Yeah, free, so that's, yeah, that's right. So this was also an extraordinary accomplishment in the history of human civilization True. at that time. This, this freedom of and from religion had never before been established as a fundamental right of human beings in any government right. in the history of human civilization right. until that point. Right. So that First Amendment, freedom of religion, uh, the establishment and free exercise clauses were truly unique and and uh, a seminal mark in human civilization. All right. When they were when America came along and we were able to accomplish that. Okay. And they came, of course, from Jefferson's uh, remonstrance against uh, religious assessments. Well, it was in the it was in the First Amendment. And uh, the Virginia Statute on yeah, Religious that's Freedom right. is the base. I'm talking the about the found the basic stated, documents stated, where yeah. that it was based upon. And and Jefferson and thought, Madison's remonstrance against uh, uh, religious uh, assessments. Uh, Jefferson put on his gravestone that his Declaration of Freedom of Religion was more important than the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, he That's listed a, that first, and he didn't bother listing the American presidency at all. Well, he was president. I, I know, but I mean on his gravestone, he listed the Declaration, the Foundation of the University, the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. He did not list the presidency on his gravestone. But everybody else did. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying. It's just a, it's just, it's a know, minor the, point the, of the, trivia, the, but it is a point of trivia. You know the interesting thing about Jefferson? There's many very well, interesting things. Well, one of the things. interesting things is that he didn't campaign orally. His inaugural dress no. was red. No, and yeah. So only the elite. Right. And he, it was printed in the paper. And he was the first one. He, he didn't deliver his State of the Union. He delivered it by paper. He was not a public speaker. He did not. He was he not was comfortable. He was a phenomenal writer, a, right. a genius writer. His and that's the key of the Declaration of Public speaking, of that's he the did key not like public speaking. He did not give public speeches. That was the speeches. Declaration of Independence. It took three people to write the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Franklin, who was the editor, mm -hmm. the compromiser from Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Jefferson, who wrote it, but it was John Adams who had the energy. Right. Declare well, independence. <laughs> and, and John Adams was the one in the Continental Congress who was leading the fight right. for, um, for independence and for this declaration. But when it came time to actually write it, he had a famous line to Jefferson about how I am... <laughs> Uh, he, he said that. You're right. I, uh, yeah, he said basically, I am suspected, I am boisterous, I am not well liked. You are none of these things. Right. <laughs> you write it. Well, you uh, know? Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Je uh, Adams had a more revolutionary grandfather, Samuel Adams. Right. And he was a real revolutionary in the Patrick Henry sense. Mm -hmm. No states' rights, no nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he's an interesting uh, pre-revolutionary pre, pre thinker. <laughs> right. And, and let, let's just, while we're at it, cover some of the other extraordinary accomplishments of the, uh, the founding of our republic. While the Magna Carta did, in, in Britain, did start to lay out things such as uh, due process and the rights of criminals, I think it's important to point out that five of the first amendments to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights have to do with due process, right. the rights of criminals, the obligations of law enforcement right. and the courts to right. uphold these rights. Right. Um, and, and that was also extraordinarily unique in that time in human civilization, that people would be afforded, the, actually, I, let me rephrase that, that we were affording ourselves in our own self-governance these protections and these rights in our criminal justice right. system. Totally unique to that point Congress in history. Congress can make no law abridging the freedom of religion. Right. Individuals, or the free exercise thereof. Free individuals can decide what their religious belief and, is. And that's one other point that I like to make to people about just the fa just where what the American experiment is and why 
our, our constitutional republic is what it is. It's not the government. It's our government. It's our self-governance. Well, I don't, this is, I, I don't particularly like that phraseology. No, I, I think that it's perfect because I hear people talk all the time about, oh, I hate it when the government does this. I hate it when the government does that. All right. Well, my answer to that is that it's not the government imposing okay. on you. The way that this republic was founded and how it's supposed to work is that we are exercising our self-governance. All, right. all, of, all of the power is inherent in the people. And it's up to us. Okay. And so that's why we have our representatives. And right. so, But the actual introduction says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, mm -hmm. establish a establish justice. justice and welfare, the general welfare. Now, the word general welfare... Provide for the general welfare. Provide yeah. for the general... That has been distorted by the conservatives to say welfare is somebody who gets on, on the dole and is, is somewhat looking for relief and looking for a handout. And welfare has become a dirty word in the hands of the conservatives. That's true. And we need to have the general welfare of the American people. That's in the... That's in the introduction I yeah and I agree it has um, unjustifiably become a dirty word because it's not it's a sense of community really right. is what it's referring to it's our general welfare okay now the problem with R and we is that the Democrats talking to other Democrats when they use the word we they mean the Democratic Party when the Republicans mean we that means the Republican Party and when NATO talks about it, it means the NATO alliance. So they use that word we all the time. And the British king talks about we, the British king. He doesn't use the word king, I am the king. He, he says we, so forth and so on. So, so we is a tremendous flexible word that can be used. I mean, what did Adolf Hitler said? I am the Fuhrer. We, the Aryan race, have established that we Aryans are going to control the future of Germany and Europe. Well, he lost the war. <laughs> so we is a very tricky word. The word we can certainly be used very narrowly or very broadly. Right. Uh, as it is used in the Constitution, it refers to the American people. Right. All of the American right. people. That's a very precise definition of it. But the politicians get into propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> That's their business, yes. And every politician and every priest and every minister uses propaganda. And they not get, just them. But they say, we're only rhetoric. It's, it's the opposition who are using propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> That's the current that's the, 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 the present vocabulary. We have rhetoric, but they have propaganda. <laughs> we versus they in every election. Right. At the present time. At the state level, at the county level. And that's the age-old... Um, Problem of language. It, well, yeah, and it's, it, it only speaks to various methods and strategies and for dividing people and pitting them against each other and invoking their sense of uh, either belonging or exclusion and, and those types of back, things that, that create gets, that end up being used to create political power. That gets back to George Orwell, my favorite philosopher, living philosopher, or let's say recent 20th century philosopher, mm -hmm. although they borrowed from Plato and earlier philosophers. But Orwell exposed the nature of propaganda. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. His, when he was able to finally, and it's interesting to read him write about this, about how his, his goals with writing, but when he was finally able to fuse his artistic purpose with his political purpose, he, he said, that's when he was able to create his best work, which turned out to be Animal Farm and uh, 1984. But that fusing of artistic purpose and um, political purpose was why he was so successful. He would often write openly about 
doing propaganda himself or others doing that propaganda. Smith. That was Winston Smith. Um, or, and he was, he was actually, it's fun to read his writing and his essays because right. he was not ostentatious at all. He was very relatable. He, reading his essays is like having a conversation with him. He's right. very casual and easy to read. Um, Unfortunately, few Americans read him. That, that is unfortunate because especially his nonfiction, I mean his fiction is great and I'm glad that it's taught in high schools and whatnot, but his, his essays and his nonfiction is nearly just as important to me as far as understanding the context of his time, the way that he was writing, because he was a socialist. He was a socialist. He became an existentialist. Who was, who was writing against, um, you know, the Stalinism. And, and what the Bolsheviks had become Ori with their... their origin originally, he was a Leninist. Right. Well, he, yeah, he became, <laughs> he became disaffected from that, from, Stalin. that, the, from the Stalin. Stalin. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. it was the Stalinism that, but he never, like, uh, repudiated socialism or anything. No, he never repudiated He stuck socialism. with it. He just repudiated Stalinism and that's that right. type of authoritarianism that right. had overtaken. And that's what Animal Farm is really all right. about, you know. The, the, the song in Animal Farm is, you know, the, the one that they end up stop singing. Right. Uh, it's the know, same as the Internationale, you know. You know, he didn't vote for the Labor Party, which was called a Socialist Party. Right. He voted for the Independent Labor Party. Right, yeah. Which was established in 1918, and they were a pacifist party. Yeah. And that's interesting, <laughs> because he wasn't exactly a pacifist. I mean, he went, I wouldn't say he was a pacifist at all, really. I mean, he went to fight in the, the Spanish Revolution for the Republicans. Well, when he went there, he discovered that... He got all, shot in the neck doing all it. All the parties were lying. The communists were lying, the soldiers were lying, the liberals were lying. Of course, it's the fascists were lying, the Catholics. Right. All parties lie. And that was the theory of Animal Farm and... Uh, 1984. 1984. Yeah. Slogans. Yeah. Right, yeah. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal yeah. than others. They I mean... Were, and that was taken from the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he would, yeah, he, he would show how these, the, these ideas, this rhetoric, this propaganda right. was used to build up these ideas in people's mind, and then they were slowly undercut right. and taken away and power... Right. Um, came to take hold. Yeah, but the, you know the interesting. And he even had you know his characters. You know, you know he Napoleon. Said, he said many times he was an atheist. But in his last days, he got married a second time. Mm -hmm. Because he had a four-year-old son, and he was on his deathbed, and he said to his nurse, "Will you marry me? Because I want you to take care of my four-year-old son." And she said yes. So then he got married on his deathbed, and he was buried in a Christian churchyard in England. Mm -hmm. So his argument about atheism was not fully developed. <laughs> he kind of retracted from that. Mm. Because why was he buried in an English cemetery? He changed his mind after yeah. he was married. And then this, I'm always suspect this new of wife, deathbed conversions. This, this, this new uh, Brownell, her name was Sonia Brownell. She had inherited the Orwell archives. Mm -hmm. That's the importance of marriage and death. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody to look after your letters after you've uh, yeah. shuffled off this mortal coil. Right. So, okay, so back to uh, progress uh, in, uh, in, in the revolutionary era. Right. So, uh, the American Revolution happened, and it was what Jefferson hoped would be this great um, domino to the fall of the monarchical systems. Down and the then line. France comes along, right. and things get messy. A sweeping revolution. Yes. They redefined revolution. Robespierre, the... The reign of terror, and this is where the term right. terrorism comes from, right. and um, the guillotine. Right. And you see, after they executed the king, who was going to be the chief executive? 
Right. So they then set the up, power politics. So began. they set up a, a, a committee called the Committee of Public Safety. Right. And then the committee... That was like five people on that, right? No, originally there were 12. 12, okay. But then it, it, it was reduced. Napoleon came in there. Napoleon was appointed... Well, this is a little bit later that he came along, though. All right. Well, let's talk about the beginning. It was like early 1800s. All right. In, in, in 1789, they set up one party called the Jacobins. It was called the Jacobin Club. Okay. Now, this is why the, that word is still used to describe radicals to this right. day. Well, it was very radical for the king. Yes. Okay. But then the Jacobins divided into factions because the French, old French constitution had three estates. The British constitution only had two, mm -hmm. the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And the Americans only had two, the Senate and the House of Representatives. But the Estates General had three estates. The first estate was the clergy. The second estate was the nobility. And the third estate was everybody else, 95% of the people. <laughs> and Burke said in the gallery yonder, there is a fourth estate, more Who's powerful it? wide than them all. Press? Yeah, the that's press. That's baloney. <laughs> I don't believe it. That's what Burke said. No, well, that's what Thomas Carlyle uh, quoted Burke as saying. Yeah, well. And that's, that's where that phrase for the press called the fourth estate comes from. Yeah, that's, that's egotistical for the press. Well, it was Burke who said it, not the press. Well, Burke was a funny fellow. Edmund Burke supported the American Revolution against the king. But after the French Revolution broke out, he wrote an essay against any further revolution and supported the monarchy and natural rights over civil rights. So Burke is riding two horses. Mm -hmm. So modern conservatives in the United States and in England look back to Edmund Burke as their founding father. That's ideological conservatism. Okay. Well, I guess that's all I'll say about Burke, unless you want to say more about him. <laughs> no, but I, I do have in my book here Christopher Hitchens writing about oh, Orwell. Oh, he's an atheist. He was an atheist. But then this he repudiated it. Hitchens? He went back on it, yeah. No, he didn't. He was discovered to be a Jew. Well, he, he had Jewish lineage in his family. He and then he became ever, a hawk. He didn't, well, he was, <laughs> he did become a war hawk in the Iraq war. That doesn't have to do with his atheism. But here he is writing about Orwell. Yeah. And this is, it is a, he, he also was a huge Orwell fan and a lover of Orwell. And he, um, I found a good passage here. Good. Where he, he is talking about Orwell and Good. how um, <clears throat> now, this is Orwell's... Who is this written by? This is written by Christopher Hitchens. Okay, go ahead. It's an essay on Animal Farm. Good. And he is talking here about how Orwell, um, how he was chased out of Spain by supporters of Joseph Stalin. Right. And his experiences had persuaded him that the majority of the left opinion was wrong right. and that the Soviet Union was a new form of hell and not an emerging utopia. That's true. He described the genesis of the idea in one of his two introductions to Animal Farm. Go ahead. So this is Orwell. Good. For the past 10 years, I have been convinced that the destruction of the Soviet myth was essential if we wanted a revival of the socialist movement. On my return from Spain, I thought of exposing the Soviet myth in a story that could be easily understood by almost anyone and which could be easily translated into other languages. However, the actual details of the story did not come to me for some time until one day, I was then living in a small village, I saw a little boy, perhaps 10 years old, driving a huge cart horse along a narrow path, whipping it whenever it tried to turn. <laughs> it struck me that if only such animals became aware of their strength, we should have no power over them, and that men exploit animals in much the same way as the rich exploit the proletariat. Right. I proceeded to analyze Marx's theory from the animal's point of view. Good. And that's where Animal for right. Farm came from, according to Orwell's introduction right. here. And as the donkey was the five-year plan. He did all the work. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry, I, just, I knew that essay was in this book, so I wanted to look it that's up and share it, that. That's where it came from. Yeah. That's satire, though. 
or Animal Farm? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so is uh, so is the other one, George Orwell. What's that? Thing? I think some of I the mean, greatest uh, political. Um, I mean, going back to to Swift, you, right. you know, like right. and he heck, even uh, Cicero. Right. Some of the greatest political criticism takes the form of satire. Good, right, and that that uh, sells to sophisticated people. Who know what satire is? <laughs> yeah. But you know. <laughs> Otherwise, people might miss the point, okay. right? But when, I, when I was a kid, when I was uh, 18, but say when I came to age, my mother called herself a fundamentalist Christian, which was a brand of Protestantism, which mm -hmm. was very, very conservative. And I went away to college in Bates College. And I discovered in the first three days at Bates College that I was the only fundamentalist on campus. Mm -hmm. And all of my students, whether they were Catholic or Protestant, thought I was a naive fool. So then we had a long debate in a bull session, informally, about what is the meaning of fundamentalism. So I told them, a fundamentalist believes that the Bible were the words of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And the second principle was you should love your God with all your mind and all your heart. But then Jesus went on to say, my God is my father a spiritual father who lives in heaven? He didn't claim that he was God. He said his father was a spiritual father in heaven. So they crucified him not as claiming to be the king of God. The Roman emperor said he was God. So he was challenging the God's authority. And Jesus said, I believe in the spirit of man, which means humanism. He got that from the Greeks. Because Israel at that time had been invaded by the Greeks, and they picked up Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. And St. Paul was a Greek philosopher and a Roman citizen. So he spoke Latin and he spoke Greek and he spoke Hebrew. Which is why many of his letters are to the Corinthians right. and so the was, Greek yeah. without, without Paul, there would be no Christian religion. Jesus would have died as a messiah, a false messiah, in, uh, in Jerusalem if it hadn't been for Paul. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, that's, that's an interesting significance of how politics and history and religion are integrated. Oh yeah, certainly. Okay, fine. They almost always are. Right, right. And and yet again, and that is another, I would say, um, that is again evidence as to why the First Amendment in the United States That's was it. so significant at its founding. This was the right. first time that these, that religion and government and politics were explicitly um, Separated. Now, you know, let me say, say something about the revolution. The word revolution was invented in the United States, and it meant the revolution of the year, the calendar. Hmm. The earth goes around the sun mm -hmm. 365, 64 days. They hadn't had telescopes, they hadn't figured out. That's why they got the date wrong. It was supposed to be zero. Right. But it was actually 4 BC, 
Yeah. To 29 AD was the life of Jesus, dated by telescopes. Mm -hmm. So revolution was not so radical in the minds of the American Revolution. And then after the American Revolution, the debate was between revolutionary French theories of revolution, in which you rebel against the state, the church, the religion. It was a more deep social revolution. The American so-called revolution is really the war of independence. It was a very conservative revolution. Right. And then they've been talking about evolution rather than revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Sanders. Sanders has come out with a new radical proposal. Political we revolution. We need a new revolution. A political revolution, yeah. Yeah. This is the way he puts that. But I don't think he wants to set up a, a guillotine and, no, <laughs> and no. a reign of terror. He explicitly does not want to overthrow the government or stage a coup or um, yeah, bring regime change in that form or regime anything. Regime change is a coup d'etat. Uh, yeah, re or anything of that, that nature. No, What he's talking about is, as he says, a political revolution, a revolution uh, working within our democratic now, republic. Now, the word coup d'etat was invented by Napoleon. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the, the French revolutionaries were suspicious of Napoleon because he won all of his battles. And he came from Corsica, and he was actually an Italian. Right. His name was Bonaparte. Right. But when he got to France, he became a very successful military man and led the revolutionary army in its early phases. So then the... the, uh, the, the, the the five men, the twelve man committee had been reduced to five men, and they said, "Well, let's get rid of this Napoleon. He's a dangerous man. We'll send him down to Italy, and he will be defeated in Italy because the Italians had a big arm. They had a huge territory, mm -hmm. but he will lose down there. Well, Napoleon whoosh, smashed those little city states." very quickly, and he took all of his nephews and nieces and put them on thrones. That's nepotism. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Napoleon called this the blow at the state, a coup d'etat. Now, that's not a real revolution. That's what they do in Latin America. One group of colonels get together and execute the other group of colonels and claim that they are the chief of state. Mm -hmm. That's a coup d'etat. Right. And then in our, in our own time, somebody changed coup d'etat to regime change. Oh, George W. Bush. That's what he did. That's yeah. the change of vocabulary. Yeah, because that's what that was the uh, the rhetoric that they used in the Iraq War. Yeah, the second Iraq yeah. War. He didn't want to say that he was going to have a coup d'etat. That right. implied violence. It was a coup d'etat, though. Yeah. Through money. Uh, through money. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. The United States is now on a limb. They think they can presidential wars. Right. Presidential wars were not declared. Now Truman began that in Korea. I, I, yeah, and I would say that that really began with the development of the atomic bomb That's and right. the uncertainty about what to do now that you had this weapon where you could be destroyed entirely or you could destroy someone else entirely in a matter of, you know, minutes right. without right. Congress, you know, having the opportunity. Because Congress has war powers, for anybody who might not know that in the audience. Congress, it constitutionally, has war powers in the United States. When the atomic... The powers is to, is to appropriate money. Right. They have to support the and they, forces. Yeah, they, they have power over the purse. But they have the, the authority to declare war. And no, they still don't. Do, what US Congress, Congress has ever declared war? What do you mean? As the United the States, U.S. Congress? Yeah, when have they declared war? We, we declared war in Iraq. Remember they voted on Who it? Who is we? Remember the, Who, the, the Congress. The President of the United States. No, the Congress voted on it. The Remember? Congress voted on a resolution. Right, for war. To give the president. Constitutionally, the Congress has war powers. Now, they can't, they're not they, the commander in chief, the, obviously. They passed a resolution. A resolution is not a declaration of war. 
Legally, it's a resolution. The in uh, in the Constitution, in the Articles, Congress is, is given the war powers. War powers to declare war. They declared war in 1917 and in 1941. Right. But they did not declare war in 1950, I believe. That's right. Congress right. And they didn't. And it was just the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. That's a resolution in, in Vietnam. That's a resolution. Although there was there was war in Iraq. Remember, they vote because remember Who voted for they did the Congress. The Congress voted for a resolution. They didn't vote for a declaration of a, in Iraq. On Iraq, mm. and Biden supported that. A and lot of Democrats did. Most Democrats did. A lot of them did not. Some of them did not. What do you think the doves were? Well, well the doves did not, obviously. Uh, okay. Why did B Basevich resign from the American Army? You've heard of Basevich. We only yeah, got two we've minutes. talked about them, him before. Basevich resigned from the army and said, "I am not declaring war. I am voting against this resolution because the United States will lose." That was the Basevich declaration, and he went back and got his Ph.D. in history. Mm -hmm. I would like to see Basevich, the new Secretary of State, from my point of view. Well, we have to stop. We only have two minutes. You summarize what we've accomplished today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a tall order. Well, we've, we've talked a lot about... Uh, Definition of words. Yeah, and the American War of Independence and the right. French Revolution and the nature of progress and what those two things accomplished as far as progress in, in governance in human civilization. And we've brought that up to today uh, you know, with modern warfare and even the Trump administration. And George Orwell's final and word. And George Orwell. George's final word was call things by their right names. Yeah. Yes. Call war, war, and call propaganda, propaganda. So and maybe we should call the War Department the War Department. It again. was called the War Department. I know, Who I know. changed it to the Defense Department? I, that was was it Roosevelt? No. Or it was in the twentieth century. I know that the Secretary of Navy was the Secretary of Navy. The Secretary of Army was called the War Department. I remember that. Yeah. You do. I know. And the successor to Truman? The, no, Truman's successor. Was uh, Truman had has his Secretary of Navy after the Secretary of Navy died? The Assistant Secretary of Navy was Forrest Forrestall. Oh, Forrestall, yeah. And he set up the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and he said, "We're going to have five branches of government. We're going to have the War Department, the Navy Department." The Marine Department. We're about out of time. We're going to have to get to that next time. Okay, well, this has been Athens Speak Out. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.